Thank you, folks. Um, so I'm, first of all, welcome. <laughs> I'm Isha, uh, and this is my colleague, Richa. Uh, both of us are from Atlassian, and we are here to talk to you about managing um, reliability and continuous delivery at scale using agile data practices. So we are both, we are both a part of the go-to-market data engineering team at Atlassian. To start with, in this session, uh, give me a second, okay. To start with in this session, uh, we're gonna look at our journey over the last decade, and then the scaling pains that we've encountered uh, in the last 10 years. We're gonna follow that with the steps that we took to overcome those challenges to reliably deliver value. And finally, we'll summarize with, um, with our wins, our current challenges, and um, key takeaways. So for folks who don't know about Atlassian, uh, we believe that teams can change the world. And it is our mission to unleash the potential in every single team. So some of our products, which you see on the screen, are used by teams to organize, discuss, and complete their work. So let's start with some context on our journey of the last decade. So we created our first true data warehouse somewhere in 2012. And as you can see, from around 2012 to 2015, most of our reporting needs were fueled by relational databases. And then 2016 is when we, first crea when we created our first data lake using AMR clusters, EC2 instances, and then our backend was S3. 2018 is when we first introduced Databricks and then started taking advantage of all the awesome features it had to offer. And then around 2020 is when we started using Databricks Delta. We became a true lake house. And then right now, we are in the process of standardizing our pool integrations with Fivetran. And we're looking to implement the Databricks Unity catalog for data governance. So when we look back, I think these are the major categories of, the scaling, of scaling pains that we had to face. When we just started, most of our issues were around reliability. So the entire team's focus was around stabilizing platforms, stabilizing data. As we matured in 2016, when we started our first data lake, the cumbersome dev and test techniques, which came with like EMR clusters, right? They made our dev cycles extremely long. To add to it, there was no, there was no self-serve because with clusters and what all, you, you do need a very specific uh, skill set. We had point integrations, we had redundancies. So that was where we were in like uh, 2016. And then we had a growth spurt uh, where we grew ridic ridiculously. So thankfully at that time, we'd already invested in self-serve platforms, but what we were not equipped for was supporting all of these users. So our operations all of a sudden became very overwhelming when it came to like, uh, you know, enhancements requ enhancement requests or just you know, answering questions, things like that, those kind of operations. And the thing is like, because we didn't invest early enough in metadata, in documentation, we had a lot of discoverability issues in the sense, and, and, and they added to the operations because you know, with questions which are like, what does this data set do? Where does it live? Things like that. So if we were to see what has helped us the most uh, over all these years, these are the main categories. I think first and foremost is team alignment. Now the team alignment is not just, um, you know, how our team works with other teams at Atlassian, it is also how um, we are aligned within our team itself. We're gonna speak a little bit about all of these categories in the later slides. Um, but let's move on to technology. Um, when it comes to technology, uh, this was the biggest contributor to scale. So self-serve platforms um, and automations, especially like Workato, have helped us scale. And then when it comes to reliability, a lot of reliability was driven by tools and best practices. So moving on to the people aspect, which I just mentioned. We function as triads. So that's where the whole alignment thing comes in the picture. So triads of product management, 
engineering and architecture. Product management is responsible for cross-team alignment and prioritization. Architecture is responsible for standardization and ensuring streamlined best practices. And then obviously engineering is a mix of uh, software engineers as well as data engineers. They are the folks who make the magic happen. Um, so typically most, uh, most of our data engineering teams have an engineering manager, a product manager, an architect, and a team of engineers. Moving on to the technology aspect of things, this is our current architecture at a very high level. Um, I'm just going to touch upon a few highlighted areas over here. But before we do that, what we've learned is throughout our journey, uh, there's a point that we'd like to share, which is that we've realized that push integrations work better for us more than, more than pull integrations, which is that with push integrations, you put the onus of emitting change events on the source, right? So the source is aware of what is being consumed. So whenever possible, we try for push integrations. It has maintenance uh, benefits as well as like latency benefits. But then not all sources, it's, it's not possible to have push, push integrations for all sources, right? So when it comes to pull integrations, that's where we standardize on five grand. Uh, which you see highlighted in the ingestion layer. And then when it comes to processing, especially we're talking analytical processing, it's all uh, Databricks. Our machine learning teams use MLflow. When it comes to the storage layer, we're uh, totally uh, dependent on Databricks Delta, especially with the maintenance and performance benefits that Delta has to offer. If you look at the uh, planning, development, and operational phase, that's where we rely on the Atlassian suite of products. Um, we also use, uh, for pipelines, we also use Airflow for orchestration, and then uh, Splunk's signal effects and Splunk logs. So this is the high-level data flow of m most critical flows that we have. Um, so for sources, what we try to do is we usually have a single point of extraction. So if you are pulling same or similar kind of data, it's usually just done once. We spoke about push and pull integrations a little in the prior slide. Let's talk about SSOTs or single source of truths. So single source of truths are where we consolidate our data, standardize our data. So there's this advantage, right, of standardization. There's also this advantage of easier adaptability because there's this one single place where you need to make changes. But the most important thing that it helps us with is that now all of the downstream customers, teams, they don't need to make changes when certain business critical flows change, right? Because they just rely on the SSOTs and the SSOTs take care of that. Um, that's not to say that all data flows include SSOTs. Like we have a bunch of data sets which fall outside the SSOT realm, but this is what we usually do for our main flows. Um, when it comes to how we function, uh, we wanted to share this um, concept that we have where we uh, work on delivering skateboards before cars. It's because we believe in providing incremental uh, delivery. So provide incremental value to your customer, and then um, adapt along the way, and then eventually build a car. So that is uh, what we usually do to, in, uh, to decrease our feedback loop and to constantly adapt. So we're gonna learn more about the agile process um, that we undertake, and I'm gonna hand it over to Richard for that. Thanks, Isha. So let's go over agile data workflows. Now it's more than necessary for the team to operate using agile workflows, not just to improve speed and quality of the data products, but also to foster a sustainable work culture. It allows team to continuously build and deploy data products, as well as uh, make timely security and feature updates. So we will be going over each and every stages of the agile workflow to understand how we are using it to continuously deliver customer value. Uh, value. Uh, we'll be primarily focusing on implementation of data pipelines and products here, 
So let's deep dive into planning and development and continuous delivery. So project planning. Let's say a team wants to do something. It can be as simple as adding a feature to existing software or as ambitious as launching a rocket into a space. Before embarking onto any project, we structure our work from largest objective down to minute details so that we can respond to change, report the progress, and stick to the plan. This is precisely done by dividing the projects into initiative, epics, and stories. Each story and task is then groomed and follow a sprint cycle until completion. So once the task is groomed and ready for development, it is assigned to engineers. So Alex and Angie are two persona of data engineers on the team who are working on different stories tied to same epic. To start the development, both the engineers create feature branch out of the main branch from Bitbucket. The integration between Bitbucket and Jira make this process seamless for engineers. So let's deep, a little di deep dive into what is happening here. So both the engineers use their local IDE to start the development. Once the code is ready for testing, it is deployed to S3 artifact bucket using AWS federated roles. If you zoom into the S3 bucket path, each engineer has its own uh, S3 bucket path dedicated to it where the code is being deployed. Once the deployment is completed, engineers can submit job using the Databricks cluster. Since Angie and Alex uh, can, has ability to submit jobs uh, against their own code, it gives them complete isolation for development and testing. Additionally, they can also submit feature documentation and also push uh, data lineage catalog as part of development, which are later published onto our internal Atlassian data portals. So let's deep dive into a little bit about testing. So unit tests are done as part of dev cycle. Uh, here, uh, the code is validated for lints and syntax checks, as well as SQL and DDL are compared for discrepancies. The expected and actual results are generated and compared using a data frame. Second comes the stage, the stage testing. So stage testing is performed once the code is deployed into staging environment uh, via a pull request. Although there can be multiple tests which can be performed as part of staging, we'll be focusing on three main tests here, which we think could be essential part of building a data pipeline. So first is a performance test, which is also known as load test or volume test. Here, code is tested against large volume of data to identify joint bottlenecks and resource usage. The integration test, where end-to-end -end pipelines are triggered to see if downstream data sets are working as expected. This is also an opportunity for newly added features uh, to check whether how they are working together. User acceptance test uh, is where data is validated for quality and are uh, tested by downstream customers. All these tests are performed uh, using uh, Python libraries and Databricks. So let's move on to the next stage, which is CI CD. Uh, we'll be cover covering build, deploy, and uh, release uh, stages. And it will be pri it's primarily achieved using the Bitbucket pipelines. So uh, build and deploy. So, inge so engineer works on a feature branch and create a pull request. Once the pull request is created, the Bitbucket pipeline starts the build process. Build process is nothing but preparing code for deployment. On successful completion of the build process and approval from the peer, the code is ready to be merged into staging. Uh, you can configure multiple uh, steps that, uh, as part of Bitbucket pipeline that are executed during the merge process. For example, here uh, we configured three steps. One is test documentation, which tests integration with a developer portal where the document need to be published. Second, it run tests which are configured as part of Bitbucket pipeline. Those are basic sanity checks. And the third is <coughs> deployment to staging, where the libraries are installed, a build process is run again, and uh, the code is deployed into stage artifact bucket. Sorry. 
So once the code is in staging and stage testing is completed, it is time for release. In, to, uh, for release, engineer creates a release branch by running a make release command. So what it does is it deletes the existing release branch, create the new one, and run NPX standard version. NPX standard version uses conventional commits to figure out the new release version and update the change log. So one, uh, once the release is ready, uh, the commits with the new version is then pushed uh, to the release branch. This is the example of the actual change log which is generated. Uh, it uh, provides information about the past releases as well as the current one. For example, release 1.5.4, which was done on June 2nd, has a bunch of bug fixes as well as feature release. Change log comes in handy when team wants to identify what went as part of the release. For example, it provides information about the JIRA ticket number, the code commits, as well as the small description of the change. So once the release is completed, code is deployed into production artifact bucket, as well as a data lineage catalog and documentation are published onto internal Atlassian portal, which are available for reference by customers as well as engineers. So this is the last step of the CI-CD and in most cases completion of uh, the feature releases because the code is now in production. But, this, but uh, the agile workflow doesn't end here. In next few slides, we'll go over operate and monitor steps uh, of the agile workflow, which are covered under data operations. So you can't improve what you don't measure. We have service level agreements with our customers and maintain a dashboard that tracks against those objectives to measure those agreements. Uh, we have an airflow job that sends a pipeline start and end time and statuses and which is compared against SLO metadata to, uh, that gives us visibility on our SLIs. Uh, all these uh, dashboards are uh, reviewed periodically uh, for team health and necessary corrective actions are taken for breaches. Data quality. So we believe that any, uh, any amount of data, if untrustworthy, is useless. We have our in-house data quality tool called Yoda, which allows team to submit SQL-based checks against data set in a data lake. It allows for periodic schedule as well as ad hoc triggers. It also integrates uh, with Airflow, where, te where teams can submit pre and post checks that are executed before a task in a DAG. Second comes the anomaly detection. Uh, we recently embarked on anomaly detection using Facebook's open source uh, profit library uh, that helps uh, highlight uh, outliers in the data and we are putting effort to make a more mature model for the same. So we talked about data quality, uh, we talked about SLO metrics, there is another critical component that uh, contributes to trust is uh, addressing security vulnerability. We use uh, automated security vulnerability, vulnerability scanner called SNCC. SNCC integrates with Bitbucket and continuously scan for possible uh, vulnerabilities, uh, outdated packages, and security issues. It scans the repository and creates a JIRA ticket, which is then assigned to uh, the service owner with SLA for completion. The second comes Bitbucket. Bitbucket has uh, inbuilt security advisor that provides recommendation on possible code vulnerabilities like a SQL injection, exposed password, or unsafe module or hash functions. So this is all about uh, data quality, uh, security vulnerability, and SLO metrics. In next slide, my colleague Isha will uh, walk you through monitoring and incident management. Thanks, Raja. So um, when it comes to monitoring, obviously there's this manual aspect to it and the, there's an automated aspect to it. The manual aspect is usually done by all of us when you know certain critical uh, changes are pushed into production. You'd probably um, you know, just, just confirm that things were deployed accurately and then manually uh, look at trends over the next few days to ensure that everything's working as expected. What we're gonna talk about is the automated flow, which is highlighted on the screen. 
So what we do is, for all of our services, microservices and pipelines, all of them constantly send uh, statistics to SignalFX. Now, SignalFX is configured in such a way um, that um, if certain thresholds are breached, it will ping Ops Genie. So that is the flow. And then let's see what happens next. And to understand what happens next, we'd like to introduce our um, operational support roles. So we have two um, support roles, uh, the on-call and the disturbed role. Both of them are roster-based roles. All of us on the team are on the roster. And uh, we'd either be disturbed or on-call for a week. And let's say I'm on-call, and I received an Ops Genie ping on my phone. What I do is, depending on the priority, we've set priorities. I'm supposed to, there are certain agreements that you know I'm supposed to action on them by certain time. So P1 priority, I'm supposed to action on it within an hour. For P2, it's business hours, so on and so forth. So let's say I received a P1 alert. What I'm expected to do is look at the alert, and then there's this run book or set of instructions, which is available in the alert itself. I don't have to look for it. I have to follow those set of instructions and then see if whatever you know, the issue was, was resolved or not. And then for whatever reason, if the issue is not resolved, the run book will have instructions on who to contact, like team or subject matter expert. So this role le needs little or no domain knowledge as such, because you just have to follow this set of instructions. Now, compared to, um, compared to this role, right, which is very structured, we have this other role, which is the disturbed role. Now we have this concept of like uh, a bunch of Slack channels at Atlassian, which are called help channels. Most of the teams have them. For example, we have help marketing DE. And anyone is free to join these channels and ask questions. And then it is the disturbed person's responsibility to address or answer those questions. So as you can imagine, this is unstructured. And then you know, if the disturbed person needs help, uh, usually, um, subject matter experts are pulled in um, to help resolve or answer the questions. What this helps with, or what these kind of roles help with, is that since there's a dedicated person who is responsible for these kind of things, the remaining team can then focus on their sprint tasks. So when it came to Disturbed, what we realized was, especially for our platform teams, even that became super overwhelming. Like there were pings every few minutes. And that's where Atlassian's help comes into the picture. So what Atlassian's help does is it uh, takes all of the context from the Slack question which was asked, automatically creates a Jira ticket, assigns it, and then sets expectations as to when the person who asked that question can expect an answer. So we've, we went over a lot of things, right? When it comes to like data operations, we discussed a bunch of aspects. There's this other aspect we'd like to discuss, which is incident management. Because this helps us retrospect, and it also helps us ensure that we are not repeating um, major mistakes again and again. So when it comes to incidents, right? Um, that is, you know, for whatever reason, there is loss of service or disruption to our internal, for us mostly it's our internal customers. Um, an incident is created. And the first step um, for an incident to be created is to first decide on the severity, depending on the impact, external, internal, things like that. Once the severity is decided, the first step that a person does is goes and updates status page and creates an incident ticket. So the update to status page is to let all of the subscribers or you know, downstream customers know that, OK, something's wrong. The incident ticket is our main point for collaboration. And across Atlassian, we have this common project for tracking incidents. So you create an incident ticket, and there are a bunch of roles associated with that ticket. One of them is the incident manager, who's responsible for forming a team and uh, collaborating just to make sure that the incident is um, closed. We have a separate person who manages communications, so on and so forth. So a team is organized, subject matter experts, whoever is needed to resolve the imminent issue at hand. So the focus is obviously stabilize, um, uh, stabilize and resolve the issue, right? So you do that. Once that happens, we close the incident. But then we have a very strict deadline or timeline 
by which we are supposed to complete the post-incident review or the PIR process. Now, the PIR process is where we'll come, all of us come together as a team, everyone who was involved in the incident and like concerned parties, and we summarize the entire incident, and then we have this framework that we work through, the framework of five whys. That is, we keep on asking why until we get to the root cause. Obviously, there can be more than five whys and we can branch, but that's the framework that we follow. Now, the whole idea of five whys, we have a blameless culture at Atlassian. The idea of four, uh, the, the, the exercise is not to find who was which team or individual was responsible for the issue. Well, it's more for us to see where we can improve and what we can do to avoid that incident again. Everything that we've discussed so far, right, all of these components, they add up, in, and, and in addition to all of these components, there's this one more component which we didn't speak about, which, is, which has to do with uh, cost and resource usage. So periodically, there's this automated report which is generated, which includes statistics about everything that Richa and I discussed when it comes to operations. And teams, um, so, so managers and leads across data engineering, then review these. And then what we do is uh, we look for red flags and then take action items for uh, red flags or you know, trends which don't look right. So we wrapped up with operations and it's time to summarize. We're gonna um, look at uh, some of our wins, some of the current challenges we are facing, and uh, finally, key takeaways. So for wins, most of our wins are around quicker insights and increased trust. So when we onboarded and started using Databricks, you know, when we started using um, uh, tools like Workato and uh, made changes, centralization changes, what happened was our dev cycles reduced and what we saw was our cost uh, decreased too. With investments in data quality and anomaly detection stuff, right? Like our uh, trust increased, and then investments in robust tools and platforms is what helped us with reliability along with best practices. With operations, sure, we distributed our workloads, but we still have a long way to go to make it more manageable, especially because the ratio of um, a data engineer or a software engineer supporting analysts or you know, supporting the community of users is, is very skewed. So even today, it's, it's like one person supporting like 30, and then the ratio is much worse when it comes to like the platform teams. But we're still, we're getting there. When it comes to discoverability, we've invested in this internal portal where uh, folks, can, uh, folks have access to the data catalog. The same place also hosts lineage information, so you know what all data sets contribute to this current data set and how the current data set is used by other data sets. And it also shows stats on data quality. And all of this is managed by like the, 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 the code, the data that fuels uh, this internal portal. We store, that, we store that information within our code. So if you were to update a column or introduce a new data set, we ensure that the documentation is always up to date. So that was the biggest advantage of storing documentation with code for us. So we spoke, we obviously, we, we still have, uh, uh, we, we have a lot of challenges and we're working through them, right? As many of you can guess, with centralization, there, there, there are bottlenecks, and that is what we are facing right now. If you look at our platform and SSOT teams especially, they are under constant pressure because all of the downstream um, teams are relying on them, right, for uh, the business critical changes that, um, that have to be made. And then at this scale and this magnitude, for every single data set that we have, we have innumerable dependencies and critical flows. So when it comes to changes like deprecation, they're extremely hard because now we have to be ready for all of our downstream consumers to be ready for that deprecation change unless you know, we can make, um, uh, unless we can do something. What comes with this whole dependencies bit 
is also this challenge of communication and collaboration. And right now we are experiencing that, um, that learning curve because it's, not hard. It's, it's really hard. And um, what we've realized is with our ever-growing community of users and the scale at that we, we are growing, um, investments in like training and education, they have to be continuous to make our operations more manageable. So we're interested in hearing about you folks, if you have any suggestions on how we can uh, work through our challenges. But uh, let's look at um, uh, the key takeaways that we've had, which hopefully uh, you folks would, um, um, hopefully it would help you folks. When it comes to scale, at least for us, the key to, uh, the key to break from linear investment in resources, right, when you're growing, was self-serve platforms and automation. When it comes to adapting to changes, it was always team alignment and the practices that we mentioned. Reliability was obviously uh, driven by um, a, a bunch of tools that we use along with best practices. But the most important of all, I'm sure you all will agree with us, is continuous learning. And then with that, we end our session. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, just a side note, Atlassian is hiring. Please visit Atlassian Careers um, to learn more. And a huge shout out to all of the Atlassians who've helped us with our content and who supported us. And then um, in clo closing, uh, please don't forget to rate our session so that we can improve. Thanks again. Thank you.